please, to the book of Revelation. And we're going to be beginning this, this evening where we left off last uh, week in the book of Revelation, chapter 13. And I'm going to be beginning, beginning uh, in verse 4. I'm going to read verses 4 and 5 to begin with. I also I want to remind you of something because uh, as I was uh, meditating in the book of Revelation, the, the old devil tried to come in He said, and he tried to say, you know, they're getting tired of that book of Revelation. And I says, no, they're not because they're being blessed. I said, devil, you know what it says in, in the book of Revelation chapter 1 verse 3? It said, he that readeth and he that heareth are blessed. Amen? How many of you want to be blessed tonight? Hallelujah. Well, we're going to get blessed tonight. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, we're going to begin in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 4. I'm going to be reading 4 and 5 here to start with. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Well, first of all, my dear people, I want to point out to you that the dragon is the Antichrist. The dragon is the Antichrist and the beast, because people get this confused, the beast is the system of which he becomes the dictator over. Okay? All right. So the dragon is the Antichrist and the beast is the system that he becomes the dictator over. Now in verse 5, here it says... uh, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. The beast system will be given a voice which speaks great things and blasphemies. Power is given unto him to continue forty and two months. So in other words, the man who will become the Antichrist does actually take this image up on himself until the last half of the tribulation hour. The tribulation hour, if you remember, is seven years. The last half, of course, is three and a half years or 42 months. Remember, the first 42 months or the first half, the Antichrist attempts to pass himself off as the man of peace. Do you remember that now? He tries to attempt to pass himself off the first half of the tribulation as the man of peace. If you remember, in Revelation chapter 6, verse 2, he came as a man on a white horse. The reason he was on a white horse then is because he was pretending to be good when he is not. You must always remember that Satan is a deceiver. If you've ever learned anything, remember that. He is a deceiver. He is a deceiver. Well... He will come as an outstanding statesman and a diplomat. He is walking the earth this very moment. He will use his abilities to combine the governments, commerce, military, and religion of the ten nations that we have studied about uh, that is commonly called the common market, of which, of course, we live in. Now you know why we struggle like we struggle, trying to preach the Word of God. We have locked horns with him. Now, he is so successful in establishing his system that the nations make him their head. At mid-tribulation, or the last 42 months, uh, he begins to attempt to conquer the world. And he also breaks his agreement with Israel. Now, the agreement, uh, the agreement that he breaks is the very same peace agreement that is in process of being negotiated right now. That it gives you an idea of how close uh, things are coming together. And after this evening, you'll really be shocked. Well, the Antichrist begins his seven-year satanic assignment at the beginning of the tribulation hour by negotiating and making a peace agreement with Israel. That is what's a peace agreement, quite frankly, is what is exactly being negotiated right now. Now, if you turn with me quickly to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. 
I'll show you where it talks about that peace agreement, and I'm going to show you a lot of other scriptures this evening where they are talking in the Word of God about this peace agreement. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 27... The Word of God says, and again, I remind you that I'm reading from the King James, And he, meaning the Antichrist, shall confirm the covenant. Now that word covenant there they're talking about is the peace agreement. With many for one week. Now one week in the book of Daniel here is talking about the 70 weeks and the 69 weeks and the one week. I won't get into that this evening, but the one week he's talking about means, in other words, it is a week of years or seven years. Do you remember that from the the other evening we were studying about that? So in other words, he shall confirm the covenant, the peace agreement, with many for one week or seven years. Now that seven years is the seven-year tribulation hour. And in the midst of the week, in other words, in the middle of the week, or in, there are three and a half years into the peace agreement, or 42 months into the peace agreement, he will, shall cause the sacrifice and the obligation to cease. In other words, that word means the offering. So, what it boils down to is the Antichrist will break covenant with Israel in the middle of the seven-year tribulation, breaking this peace agreement that's talking about here in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And we're going to show you a lot more scriptures in relation to this this evening. It will give you a little bit more insight. Now, I want to explain to you that the Antichrist is revealed, it's very important for the body of Christ to know this, that the Antichrist is revealed only after the rapture of the church. Only after the rapture of the church, we were raptured, if you remember, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. The Antichrist then is revealed in Revelation chapter 2, I'm sorry, chapter 6, verse 2, when he came as the man on the white horse. You still with me? Okay. And of course he will show up to make this peace agreement. That's the reason he comes as a man of peace on a white horse. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit more insight into the last days. Now, turn with me, please, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Thank you, Father. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And there's some scriptures I want you to, uh, to underline because this is going to be a tremendous witnessing tool for you. In 2 Thessalonians... Chapter 2, we're going to get some more insight into the last days. Beginning here in verse 1 of 2 Thessalonians. Everybody got it? Okay. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's speaking here about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Exactly the same thing we're talking about here this evening. And by our gathering together unto him. Is that what we're not doing here this evening? Gathering together unto him? Then he says in verse 2, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. In other words, the word of God is saying here, dear beloved, in other words, don't be shaken up, don't worry, because the day is at hand, you're already born again. That's what he's saying, in essence. Okay. But he says, in verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there be a falling away first. Now, my dear people, I want to point out to you that the term there, falling away, in the Greek, means to depart. It means to depart. So, in other words, for that day shall not come except there be a depart. In other words, the body of Christ has got to depart. In other words, before we've got to be raptured. We're going to depart. Okay. For that day shall not come except there shall come a falling away. In other words, that's the rapture of the church. And then the uh, man of... See, 
And that the, the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, speaking the, of the Antichrist. So you can see there in verse 3, let no man deceive you. No, it's already to you this way. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. What day? The second coming of Jesus Christ. Except there be a rapture, falling away, departing. And then the man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition, who is the Antichrist. You still with me? Verse 4, who opposeth, speaking about the Antichrist, and exalteth himself uh, above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, uh, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. In other words, the Antichrist will actually sit down in the temple in, in uh, Jerusalem and say, hey, I'm God, although he's the Antichrist. Still with me? Verse 5, remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you of these things. Paul the Apostle had told the believers these things. And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. In other words, it is the true church is what is withholding the Antichrist right now. The righteousness. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who doth now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the sword or the spirit of his mouth. Uh, the right there, of course, is the, the, with, uh, when the Lord comes with the spirit of his mouth or the word of God, that is the second coming. You see? Okay. And he shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Speaking of the Antichrist. Verse 10, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the, the, the love of the truth that they might be saved, and for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, and that they all might be damned who believed not truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And that's what I want to point, you out, to, point out to you this evening. First of all, in Revelation chapter 9, I'm sorry, chapter 7, verse 9, the Word of God talks about there is going to be many, many people brought to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ during the seven-year tribulation hour. However, if you read here in verses 10 through 11, what it's saying here is, I'm going to... And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. And I'm going to start. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You know what that word is saying there? You know what that word is saying? I'm going to read it to you from the Amplified. Beginning the last sentence in, in, in verse 10, it says, Because they did not welcome the truth, but refused to love it, that they might be saved, therefore God sends up on them a misleading influence, a working of error, and a strong delusion to make them believe what is false, in order that all may be judged and condemned who did not believe in, or who refused to adhere in, trust in and rely on the truth but instead took pleasure in unrighteousness. So what that, the Word of God is saying there is, first of all, the word delusion means, in the Greek word it's plain, P-L-A-N-E, and it means a wandering, led astray, wrong opinions or error. Uh, it means to be led astray or, or error in morals or religion. So what is that word saying? It is saying that if an individual has heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and understands it before the rapture, they will not be given a second chance to embrace Christ after the rapture. Did you hear what that says? God will actually blind these people to the truth and harden their hearts so that they will not be able to be saved. 
And that's what it means there in verse 12 when it says, They believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So in other words, if someone out here has heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and has refused him and said, No, I don't want to serve him. I would rather walk in unrighteousness. They, if, if, they are not to, if they do not receive Jesus Christ prior to the, not, the rapture, God will not extend his saving grace after the rapture. They will not be saved. They will be damned. That's heavy, isn't it? You say, boy, that sounds awful hard. Well, it's just like God hardened the heart of Pharaoh in Egypt. You see? There comes a time when God says, enough. Enough. And that's what we're reading right there. So, my dear people, if there are loved ones that we have that know the gospel of Jesus Christ and continue to walk in unrighteousness, if they do not come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ before the rapture, they won't be raptured. Hallelujah. Sir, I want you to underline that. Now, let's go back to Revelation chapter 13 and verse 6. We'll keep moving on here. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, speaking of the Antichrist, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. In other words, our Lord, if you remember, our Lord Jesus Christ was accused of blasphemy when he was on the earth. The Word of God says in John 1.11 that he came unto his own, and his own received him not. And ironically, the world accepts the Antichrist claim to deity. Isn't that, isn't that ironic? But they do. They accept his claim to deity. And, that, and of course, that is what the, it's talking about here when it's talking about the blaspheme or blasphemy to God. Now let's go on to verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given unto him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. What we see here is the fight is on for the saints of the tribulation. This is speaking about the tribulation saints of the tribulation hour. This is not the church because we were raptured back way back in verse chapter in verse four one, chapter four verse one. But Satan battles the church the, the tribulation hour. There and then he battles a church that we're with us when we return with our Lord Jesus Christ in chapter 19 of Revelation, verse 14, which is the second coming of Jesus Christ, which is the battle of Armageddon. Everybody got that now? Because see, Jesus Christ comes twice. He comes twice. The first time we meet him in the air. That's the rapture. The second time his feet touch down at the Mount of Olives. That is the battle of Armageddon. The first time we meet him in the air, in the clouds. The second time we come with him to battle, at the battle of Armageddon. Okay, that's the second coming. Now, in this verse uh, of Revelation 13, 7, Satan is attempting to destroy the millions, and there are literally millions, who washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb that the Word talks about in Revelation 7.14. In other words, these are the tribulation saints. Okay. These are also the same tribulation saints who refuse the mark of the beast that we'll be covering here later. These are the same tribulation saints. And I'll give you a scripture reference for that here shortly. Now remember, and these are also the same tribulation saints that the Word talks about in Revelation 12.11. They overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. The same saints. Okay. Now in verse 7 it says, And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. In verse 7, the Antichrist was given power over all kindreds, languages, and nations. So, if you remember, in verse 2 it reveals that Satan gave the Antichrist the authority. So he has satanic authority and power to make war against and to overcome the 144,000 Jewish evangelists, their converts, and the hidden 
remnant of Israel. However, praise God, the Antichrist finds that impossible. <laughs> Amen? Why? Because you see, after the Antichrist breaks his agreement, the peace agreement with Israel at mid-tribulation, he attempts to make war with Israel. But he fails. Why? It's because the converts of the 144,000 are caught up to heaven and the remnant of Israel is hidden away. Do you remember that? Where did they go? They were flown out on the wings of an eagle. Do you remember that? It was an American airlift. It was American airlift. Okay. So, that's, in essence, uh, his, what he's doing there. Now, there are many names and titles that are given to the Antichrist in the Word of God that I'm going to give you for study purposes at those that are taking notes. I must give you a bunch of scriptures and, and then some of the names that the Word of God gives. First of all, in Isaiah chapter 10, verses 5 through 12, he is called the Assyrian. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of people think he will be from, Assy from Assyria. In Isaiah 14, 4, he is called the king of Babylon. In Isaiah 16, verses 4 and 5, he's called the spoiler. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 8, he is called the little horn. Daniel's little horn. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 21, he's called the vile person. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 21, he is called, I'll give you that, didn't I? The vile person. In, da in Daniel chapter 11, verse 36, he is called the willful king. In 2 Thessalonians verse, chapter 2, verse 3, he is called the man of sin. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, he is called the son of perdition. And of course, in Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, he is called the beast. Now, it's interesting for those that are, you know, study at home, is to take those scriptures and read them and study. You'll be surprised how you'll, you'll be enlightened. Now, the Word of God says that he will appear on the scene in the latter time of Israel's history. Now we're going to go back to the book of Daniel for a few scriptures. If you go back, please, to the book of Daniel, chapter 8. Book of Daniel, chapter 8. And this will show you some of these things. Hallelujah. Now, in the book of Daniel, chapter 8, and verse 23, now keep your finger in the book of Daniel for a few, for a few minutes. In verse, I'm sorry, chapter 8, verse 23, it says, you're making notes there, and in the latter time of their kingdom, the word their kingdom is talking about the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel. When the transgressors are come to the full, a king, you may want to circle that word king because that's the, if you notice the little K there is talking about the Antichrist. A king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. So you see, the Antichrist will appear on the scene in the latter day of Israel's history. His manifestation is being hindered right now by the true church. If you remember, we're reading that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6. In other words, the true church is what withholdeth. Now let's go back to Daniel chapter 8 again. The, the, the Antichrist will be demon-possessed. He will be a Satan-controlled man. And he will communicate with Satan. If you notice here in verse 24, it says, And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. Because you see, he will be hearing from Satan, the Antichrist. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Speaking of Israel. The people there he's speaking of is Israel. Now, please remember, my dear people, that the rise that he comes up is through is his peace agreement or the peace program 
in Israel. Remember when I said, I said, I will show you a few more scriptures concerning the peace agreement that's being negotiated right now. If you look there in verse 25, it says, And through his policy, meaning the Antichrist, also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. In other words, you see, the first three and a half years of the tribulation, if you remember, are going to be prosper, prosper and prosperity. And he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace... Shall he destroy many? Speaking of the peace agreement. By peace uh, shall he destroy many. Then it says, He shall stand up against the prince of princes, meaning Jesus Christ. He shall stand up uh, against the prince of princes, uh, but he shall be broken uh, without hand. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We also see about the peace program in chapter 11 of Daniel in verse 21. Again, it's talking about the, the Antichrist, and this is where he calls him the vile person. It said in verse 21 of chapter 11, And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably, in other words, through the peace agreement, and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Do you remember? He's a deceiver, my dear people. He's going to come in. He's not going to negotiate this peace agreement with Israel because, you see, nobody else can do it. Nobody's ever been able to do it. You see? And because of that, he is going to be exalted because of this peace agreement. There's a man of uh, great wisdom, etc., etc. Now, please remember, and stay in Daniel right now, that as the head of the ten-nation empire, what was the ten-nation empire? The common market. He will make a seven-year covenant, which is the peace agreement we just showed you, with Israel, which is broken after 42 months at mid-tribulation. And you say, well, how do you know it's mid-tribulation? If you remember there, in chapter 9, verse 27 of Daniel, it says, And he, meaning the Antichrist, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, meaning seven years, and in the midst of the week, in other words, in the middle of the agreement, the three and a half year period, he will break the peace agreement. Of course, he will declare war on Israel. Okay. Now let's go back to the book of Revelation chapter 13. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Book of Revelation chapter 13 and in verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Then in verse 9 he says, If any man have an ear, let him hear. He's saying, If any man have an ear, let him hear. In other words, verse 9 is saying is further emphasis uh, that destruction awaits these people. Destruction awaits these people who foolishly do not accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And then we read in verse 10, it says, uh, He that leadeth into captivity 